and got it. There we go. Are we ready? Um, thank you for the introduction, Stephanie. Uh, I'm happy to share with everyone uh, a little side project that I was able to, to take part of here at my time during NDSU, which focuses on enicocephalids and specifically the genus Stelodaries in North America. <clears throat> so why enicocephalids? Well, they're just cool, right? I mean, not only do they have cool, unique head morphology, but they're also predators. They, they live in soil and leaf litter, um, even on um, uh, epiphytic plants where they're predators of uh, microinvertebrates. They also exhibit um, lecking behavior or mating swarms that are usually comprised of, of one to a few females and dozens to hundreds of males. And uh, it's, a, it's quite a sight to see if you, ever, if you ever have the opportunity to see them. They're also a, quite an ancient lineage of heteroptera, and yet um, even though they're ancient, they have their own unique specialized morphologies that are quite derived. And quite literally, they can be found right under our feet. <clears throat> now, some of these smaller orders don't get studied as much, uh, and it uh, can be challenging to get funding for uh, these types of projects. So how do, how, do, how do we pay the bills here at NDSU? Well, at NDSU, we do a lot of uh, ecological surveys, uh, sometimes uh, related to pests uh, or just general, um, general species lists and faunistic surveys uh, in the, the grasslands and forests of our state. Um, <clears throat> one of the surveys that, we were, that I was a part of was actually part of the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey or the CAPS program. This is a national program administered by the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. And it uh, uh, is administered through cooperation by individual state uh, agricultural departments. Uh, in North Dakota, our agricultural department is the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. Uh, and they were our uh, liaison for uh, sourcing funding and, uh, and um, contracts for this program. These, this program is to screen for known and potential invasive species uh, that are getting to different parts of, of the country. And there are several different uh, programs within the CAPS, uh, uh, CAPS per survey, uh, and ours focused on invasive wood boring insects. And yes, if you're familiar with North Dakota, we do have trees. <laughs> Not very many, but we do have trees. And we actually want to protect them from the real threat. So insects, and especially invasive wood boring insects, are spread uh, specifically through global trade and travel. And that's because a lot of goods are transported on wooden pallets and subsequently sent from across continents or within continents. And also, we even have individuals that transport wood across state lines, bringing pests with them. <clears throat> So the North Dakota uh, effort for this CAPS program has uh, eight to nine locations across the state of North Dakota, uh, one of which is at, at North Dakota State University. And each trap location has eight to nine Lindgren funnel traps. You can see a uh, black funnel trap uh, in the middle there. And the samples are collected bi-weekly and then processed in the writer, in writer, in Dr. Dave Ryder's lab. Uh, in the, the right, uh, we can see this is the former site location for the uh, survey at NDSU's campus, which was in uh, a shelter belt uh, surrounding a mixed horticultural uh, use uh, research and demonstration plot. So for sample processing, once we get our samples, we take them back to the lab and put them in alcohol. And then we subsequently sort out the beetles and the bugs because uh, we're all heteropterists here, right? Uh, and then uh, the rest of the insects go in a different uh, uh, vi uh, vial or jar. After they're sorted, we then take the beetles and identify the, the, the different groups of beetles, the longhorn beetles, the bark beetles, uh, to look for species that um, are of uh, importance or of uh, quarantine concern. Well, early on in my time at NDSU, I was sorting a sample and in one, 
there was one lone enicosaphalid floating around. <laughs> of course, I was so excited that there was that, that there was an enicosaphalid that I didn't take a picture. Um, but I have the specimen. We have the specimen, and it's in our collection. Uh, of course, because I'm in a lab, you know, where we study Heteroptera, I showed it to Dr. Ryder, and he was also very intrigued uh, because we never thought we would find an enicosaphalid in North Dakota. And that got me interested to figure out, well, what what did I actually find? So I went looking, uh, and the enicocephalomorph of North America, we know that there are two families. I determined it was family enicocephalidae, and there are two subfamilies. And this, of course, is an enicocephaline. And there are five genera to, to determine uh, which genus it was. Um, fortunately, it was the genus Estelloderes. And um, then I went looking at determining which species we had. Well, the genus Estelloderes currently has 19 described species found in the Western Hemisphere. However, Wygodinsky and Schmidt uh, state that there's likely over 40 species. So there's many undescribed. And Kritsky in 1978 reviewed the North American and Caribbean species. So I thought, oh, great, there's a key. I can identify this. Well, I tried, and the specimen I had was tenoral and also a female. So I couldn't be certain definitively what it was. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that project got shelved for a few years, and I decided to take up gardening. So in 2018, I rented a community a garden plot in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, and one day when I went out to water our garden, uh, I went to our, our water tank and went to fill up a can. And as I was filling a can, an enicosaphalid landed on my thumb. I was with my wife and I immediately started screaming, enicosaphalid, enicosaphalid. She turns around. <laughs> And looks at me and says, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you hurt? I said, no, I have an enicosaphalid on my hand. Then I looked up and saw we were in the midst of a mating swarm. <laughs> of course, I did not have a net. I did not have a vial. I didn't have a single container in which I could capture these, these bugs. So my wife and I were frantically looking around and we ended up finding an abandoned water bottle that was empty, thankfully, and had its lid. <laughs> so we waved our arms around and caught a bunch of enicosaphalids and uh, put them in the bottle, and we had our, our, our prized possession. We were able to take our specimens back to the lab. Now, after taking these uh, and running them through uh, Kritsky's key again, I also... Oh, sorry. <laughs> after running through Kritsky's key again, I was like, okay, I can get this figured out. And I also remembered... North Dakota has gone through several periods of glaciation. So really, if you think about it, faunistically, we don't have a lot of diversity here. And that's because a lot of the species that reach our region are widespread Eastern, uh, Western or Southwestern or Great Plains species that, that make it to our region. Um, and they've only had about 11,000 years or so to get here. Um, we don't, the, the endemics we have for this region were once widespread and now might be localized still in North Dakota, uh, but have been extirpated from other pla places of, of the country. So after running it through Kritsky's key, I determined I had Cistelloderi's biceps. Yay! All right, I figured out what it was. And in all of my reading and investigation, I found, well, it's the most widespread species in North America. And in reading some of the literature, especially the recent reports uh, from Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and Ohio, they, they cite the, the Froschner's portion of the Henry and Froschner catalog for the overall distribution and the records of um, where this species has been reported. I thought, well, how about we look at the original uh, accounts and original reports of this species and uh, where it was reported? So the following are all mentions of the name Cistelloderi's biceps in North America. It was first described from Pennsylvania by Say, 
and then subsequently reported from Virginia. Then Blatchley found it in Florida and Indiana. Drake and Harris described a species that Kritsky synonymized, but from Iowa. Barber reported it from New York. Usinger reported it from Illinois. <clears throat> And then in 1934, Tori Buena reported it from Canada for the first time in Nova Scotia. A year later, Wally found it in Quebec. And Glick found it in Louisiana. Brimley then found it in North Carolina. And Janelle reported it from Costa Rica and Panama. McClure found it in Kentucky. And in an unpublished dissertation, Rittenmeyer reported from Kansas. Drew and Van Cleve reported it from Oklahoma. Aleo reported it from Cuba. And then in Kritsky's dissertation, he reports it from Arkansas. And Froschner reports it from Rhode Island. Then Krath and Young reported it from Wisconsin. And then the Ma et al. checklist reports it from Ontario. Uh, Coscarana Delape reported it from Mexico. Swanson report from Michigan and Ohio, and now I have it in North Dakota. So these are all the uh, records of this species and where it's been reported in North America. There's another species, though, that's largely forgotten or has been at different points in history. So Cystelladeris culissus was described by Euler in the late 1800s. And it also seemingly has a wide-ranging distribution. And Euler described it from several different places uh, in Utah, Arizona, Florida. Then Wertner reported from Pennsylvania. And Barber said he had the same or a similar species from Maryland and Tennessee. Johansson reported it from New York and Missouri. Bradley reported from Georgia, and then Bergroth synonymized this with biceps in 1913. Usinger resurrected it, though, in 1945, stating he examined the type specimens and said it's, it's distinctly different. And Kritsky, in his unpublished dissertation, reported it from California and suggested it was a Western species. So <clears throat> this got me thinking, we've got two really widespread species here. So What's what's going on? Well, biceps is the oldest name, and this name early on was largely ignored until Bergroth synonymized culissus with biceps. Additionally, Cystelladeris culissus, that the type series is 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 likely mixed. However, Euler in his original description said that most of the specimens he had were in too poor a state of preservation to use. So it's unclear which specimens were actually used in his description. And um, although he specifically said he had two specimens from Utah. Now, interestingly, electotype has not actually been designated from what I can find in the literature, even though it's got the specimen have lectotype, the specimen has lectotype labels on it. Um, but uh, Kritsky, in his uh, coverage of, of this genus in, in North America, said that the type locality was Salt Lake. And there you can see the unit tray from the Smithsonian provided by Tom. We don't have any Eastern um, uh, North American uh, specimens in that tray. So I went looking at Kritsky's dissertation. And in it, he actually has beautiful maps there. He draws the purported distributions for some of these species. So he suggested that Culissus's distribution is in the south, uh, western and, uh, uh, southwestern United States, uh, parts of the Great Basin and the uh, 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 American Southwest. And, and Biceps is in the northeastern part part of uh, North America into the Midwest and the Southern uh, Central Great Plains. However, there are more species involved here and it's always more complicated. Even as we try to distill things down, there's, there's always more things to make, make, uh, make, it, make the story more complicated. 
there are other species involved here. Uh, so one of the species is Cystelodaris insidiatus, which was described from Mississippi. And Kritsky suggests it's found throughout the southeastern United States. And then several other species involved. Uh, Cystelodaris crassatus is known from the southwestern United States. Cystelodaris grandis is only known from Oregon. And Cystelodaris lateralis was described from Maryland. Uh, and I have a little bit more to say about that. Um, also not mentioned here, one species was actually described from Ames, Iowa, of all places. And it really messes up the overall geographic distribution and the biogeography of this group in terms of its morphology. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. So looking at all of uh, Kritsky's findings and the original literature, this is my uh, suggestion for what the likely distributions are in North America. So Cystelodiris biceps, the records are likely in the red. Cystelodiris culissus are in the blue. And then the records in pink are probably Cystelodiris insidiatus, uh, oh, it, or they may correspond to lateralis or other species, but they need to be verified. So I'm still working on verifying specimens from those parts of the, the country. I'm also working on uh, confirming which species are found in northwestern and northeastern Mexico, because as um, we all are probably aware, species don't conform to geopolitical borders. Uh, also, the Cuban species uh, or the specimens that it were uh, described from Cuba have been reported either as biceps or culissus, uh, yet they may be in another species entirely. And this enigmatic Iowan species uh, that Drake and Harris described from Ames was actually described from uh, concentration cages where they were trying to rear Hessian fly. And in particular, they suggest it's most likely related and similar to a species that's found in Central America. And if you look at the morphology of the Central American and, and uh, um, neotropical species, the formation of the spines on their, their tibia are different than those in Northern North America. So that, that begs the question, is this species that was described from Iowa actually an Iowan endemic or is it something that was brought up or introduced accidentally? And recently, a few years ago, Cystelodiris lateralis, which was described from Mich uh, Maryland, has also been reported in two Mexican states. So, and I've looked at the papers and the figures they have do very much look like lateralis. Uh, so there's more work that still needs to be done to verify the overall distributions of the species involved in North America. Um, oh, there we go. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Charles Elhard with the North Dakota Department of Agriculture for acquiring funding for uh, uh, Dr. Ryder and uh, for the CAPS program. I'd also like to thank uh, Gerald Fowski, the collections manager of the North Dakota State Insect uh, Research Collection here at NDSU for providing photos and also uh, assistance with this, uh, the CAPS program. Uh, Tom Henry uh, at, at the, the USNM and uh, Gene Kritsky for him sharing his thoughts uh, uh, over a few different emails I've had uh, corresponding with him. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you have.